Lash, and I'm outside the Hub Culture Pavilion here in Davos. Really honored now to be joined by Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. Thanks very much for coming along. Uh, my pleasure. So tell me, this year it's about leadership, but what takeaways, what have you sort of seen in the last year? What thoughts on the fourth industrial revolution? Well, the fourth in industrial revolution offers challenge, and it, but it offers opportunity. Uh, because of this merger of the physical, the digital, and the biological worlds, obviously there's great uh, opportunity. Let's look at CRISPR, the gene editing uh, mm -hmm. technique. Obviously, one can think about that to um, intervene and perhaps uh, ward off diseases. In our case, in our university, uh, faculty are using uh, CRISPR to control uh, cell signaling pathways. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it allows them to turn uh, cells into little factories mm -hmm. to create uh, therapeutics. And so this is work that's just beginning, but it has great potential. Uh, but every new technology has a knife edge, and so one has to be careful. And that requires that we be responsive, meaning looking at the issues, what can we do about them, where are the opportunities, how do we seize them, but being responsible, which is to think more broadly about the impact of what we do on people, and as well as in the case of the fourth industrial revolution, the ethical considerations as well. What thoughts have you apply that to artificial intelligence? Well, I think artificial intelligence is just that at the moment, mm -hmm. that it is created by humans. It's evolving quickly with things like the, you know, deep learning and, and so forth, but we still have not totally gotten to a point where uh, an artificially intelligent system uh, quite reasons and feels mm -hmm. uh, as we do. And so when we get to the point that the system evolves on its own, then some of these deeper questions about what, the, what, what it means to be human uh, and how that uh, allows us to interact or not, or as some people fear, to be controlled or not by uh, such artificially intelligent systems. But I don't think we're there yet, but it, we have time to think about the mm -hmm. development of the technology and uh, not only what we might do to embed in that technology uh, safeguards against some of the things people worry about, if possible, mm -hmm. but also what protocols should be developed around the use of some of these technologies. Now, I'm a big believer in the role of science and technology to uplift people, mm -hmm. to make a difference in their lives, whether we're talking about the mitigation of disease, about uh, creating a, a sustainable planet, mm -hmm. Uh, particularly as it relates to climate and, and general environmental concerns. Uh, and that includes uh, new sources of energy. But it also includes being able to use the kinds of technologies that the fourth industrial revolution uh, uh, has engendered and is engendering to think about how we even plan cities, how we think about how people live. And so I uh, happened to moderate a session on powering mobility mm -hmm. yesterday. And so people were discussing, uh, of course, the electrification of automobiles mm -hmm. and ma mass transit. And I think that's so very important. But if we really have the chance now to uh, bring in the digital world, to put artificial intelligence, or let's say intelligent digital mm -hmm. uh, beings into our systems, it gives us the chance to think about a whole different way of designing transportation systems by, by starting with what makes people move about, right. what do they want to do. It, but that also then extends to how we even design buildings, uh, the layout, mm -hmm. the architecture of cities, but also how we incorporate these same new technologies into building design itself so that we have less demand mm -hmm. for energy. So it's not just can we come up with renewable sources? Can we even change the demand curve by thinking about how people live? But in order to do that, we also have to bring in the social sciences, the humanities, even the arts, 
because aesthetics matter as well when we are designing things. So I think the opportunities are vast, but we just have to make sure that we do it within a context where we consider the whole equation. I want to talk a little bit about, as you look down the pipeline, sure. it's a terrible way to, to put it, but as you look around people at your university, young women, yes. getting young women to the position where you are, yes. encouraging women to get into science, technology, even yes. the arts, uh, if we use it STEAM instead of STEM, no. what do you think matters the most? What makes the most difference? Well, first of all, I think what makes the most difference, particularly with young women at the time I see them when they're coming into mm -hmm. the university, is themselves being able to feel they can make a difference. And so that takes a, a kind of a confidence mm -hmm. as well as a motivation to do something that's meaningful and do something that's potentially important. But before a young woman gets to that point, she has to develop that confidence. And I think that confidence depends upon multiple factors. Among them, what happens in her home life. Mm -hmm. You know, what encouragement uh, she gets from her own family, uh, especially her parents. Yep. There are so many young women uh, whom I know who are pursuing degrees and careers in science and engineering, who in fact uh, talk about the influence of their fathers Interesting. in terms of uh, giving them the motivation. Who was important? Your father was important for you. My father was very important for me and so in fact uh, So was mine in fact and he was an engineer. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> well my father had he been born in a different time mm -hmm. uh, would have been an engineer I think. He was very gifted mechanically and, mm -hmm. and did some amazing things particularly during World War II mm -hmm. and so he in fact was able to fashion a special mechanical splice mm -hmm. that allowed the repair in situ, in the situation of the rudders of the landing, the amphibious landing vehicles bringing uh, troops to shore. So he saved a lot of lives. He got a uh, bronze star for that, even though he served in a segregated unit. Okay. So I'm very focused on what I call uh, your window in time, mm -hmm. meaning, you know, how then does a window in time open for a person? And that depends on larger societal forces. But then if that window does open, that one has to be prepared to step through. And preparation obviously has an academic component to it, but it does have this uh, motivational and, and uh, self-confidence component. Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for stopping by no, the Hub Culture Pavilion here thank you. in Davos, and I'm Edie Lush.